community populations. So um, as I mentioned, my role in the organization is to focus on the unique risks and the capabilities of displaced women and girls, which are often overlooked. Um, so prior to Refugees International, I was the director of protection programs for a global refugee agency called HIAS. So I, uh, so I went you know, to their offices around the world and managed legal protection programs. So trying to get asylum seekers, for example, refugee status, trying to get protection for, for various displaced people. And then finally, before HIAS, I worked for about a decade in um, Kenya, Egypt, Uganda, and Lebanon. So each of those countries, I worked in UNHCR offices. And UNHCR is the UN Agency for Refugees, so the High Commissioner for Refugees. So the point of all that is to say that I have a global view of the situation. I don't focus on one specific area. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, because certainly as we know, just as the COVID-19 pandemic has spread throughout virtually the entire world, it too has affected refugees worldwide in pretty dramatic ways. Um, and I don't know how many of you, I know the conference has, has spanned a wide variety of topics. So I don't know how many of you know all the information about refugees and asylum seekers, but before beginning to get into COVID-19, I just wanna provide you with a quick few definitions um, that, that you might already know, but it's important to share as a foundation so that we can, you know, for what we're talking about. So there are some important legal distinctions between the terms internally displaced person, asylum seeker, and refugee. And so all might have fled for their lives for the same reasons even, but an internally displaced person is one who has fled within his or her own country. An asylum seeker has crossed an international border and is requesting the permission to remain. And a refugee is one who has crossed an international border and either the host country government has officially recognized him or her as a refugee or the UN refugee agency operating that country has done so, which is some of the work that I did. So, so today, what I really wanna focus on is refugees and asylum seekers. So when people or news articles or things you read about say that there's 80 million forcibly displaced people in the world, the majority of them are IDPs, internally displaced people. But I'm gonna speak about how this pandemic has affected those who are outside of their own countries. So the 29.6 million refugees and the 4.2 million asylum seekers who are waiting for decisions on their applications. And so there are two groups of statistics I wanna share with you first. Um, I'll start with COVID-19. So you've been talking about it all day. So you might uh, know this already. I mean, you, you know the general numbers, but you know, you might've talked about them in earlier sessions, but as of 7.25 this morning, there were 57,726,802 confirmed cases of COVID worldwide and 1,374,985 deaths. So of course, we have to assume that these numbers are actually much higher in reality um, because in many countries that host refugees and asylum seekers, their ability and perhaps even in some cases their interest to do testing and, and get the real numbers is quite low. So for example, in Afghanistan, which I've just been writing about, they have conducted less than 134,000 tests and they have a population of 36 million. So it's clearly underreported in a lot of places. Um, so we can assume those numbers are higher. But keeping those numbers in mind, I wanna to turn to some, to some statistics, excuse me, about refugees and asylum seekers. So where are the most refugees and asylum seekers originating from? Where are they passing through and where are they going to? So within the UN lingo, which I still use quite, quite often, we call these uh, origin, transit, and destination countries, respectively. So, you know, they, they explain themselves, basically, the, the words. Um, and a majority of refugees and asylum seekers come from just five countries. In order, they are Syria, and I'll give you time to think about it. <laughs> if, I, if I was in a classroom, I'd ask you and give you time to guess. But um, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. So more than 60% of refugees come from those countries. Um, and so these are the countries where most people are fleeing from. But as we look at how COVID-19 has affected the global refugee population, we have to look at where, these, where have these people gone to? Where are they living now? Who's hosting them? What countries? What capacity do the countries have? Um, and so if you remember anything <laughs> from this presentation, remember this. We, as the United States, are not hosting them. We are not hosting a large number of refugees. We, have a, we had a big resettlement program. That's a whole different topic. 
we don't we don't host most refugees. Most refugees are hosted by neighboring countries to whatever country people are fleeing from. Um, most countries in developed health, you know, so we as the US are not hosting them. Most countries in developed healthcare that have developed healthcare infrastructure in Europe, for example, are not hosting them with one slight exception that I'll go into, but it's countries that are neighboring to the countries of origin, as I mentioned. So more than 80% of the world's refugees are being hosted in developing countries affected by food insecurity and malnutrition. Um, basically, an overwhelming majority of refugees are living in poor countries that have limited means um, themselves to, to deal with problems in their own countries. So that I think is, yeah, the one thing to take away is that, you know, it does frustrate me sometimes where we, we think that, you know, we're focused on our own policies and it makes us think that a lot of refugees are coming here. That is not really the case. Refugees are hosted in their neighboring countries for the most part. So just so you know, the top hosting countries in order are Turkey, Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda, and then the exception I was mentioning is Germany, which is the fifth largest because they're hosting about, they're hosting 1.1 million refugees and most of them are Syrian um, based on the policies they've had in the last few years. So now that you know who refugees are, where they come from and where they are now, um, I wanna talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting them. We've had some time to see what's going on. And um, first I wanna say that as the pandemic began taking hold worldwide in the spring of this year, my colleagues and I at Refugees International were particularly concerned about several issues. And to be quite honest, at first we didn't wanna address COVID-19. We didn't know what it would become, you know, like many of us didn't. And so, you know, again, we're not, we're not health specialists, but we certainly specialize in uh, identifying protection needs for refugees. So the, the issues we were concerned about were, number one, that as governments and countries locked down and tried to protect and assist their own citizens, they would not include refugees and asylum seekers in their responses. And obviously, we clearly thought this was a mistake. It is a mistake. Um, the scale and speed of the pandemic underscore how deeply interconnected the world's populations are. The virus does not respect borders or paperwork <laughs> or whether you're you know, an asylum seeker or refugee. So as we wrote, as we wrote on our very first report on this topic, um, quote, I would say a truly effective response, not to mention a morally correct one, also must not discriminate. Um, that kind of, that was definitely our position there, but, but that is, is certainly something that we've been seeing develop. Number two, the next issue we were concerned about were that refugees and asylum seekers often live in incredibly dense areas. For any of you who have been to any refugee settlements or camps or just refugee hosting communities, um, they're either in cramped conditions, including formal camps and formal settlements or popula population dense urban spaces, or wherever they're living, they're usually in very close quarters. So many times they're forced to share the same bathroom or cooking or bathing facilities if they have access to those. Um, and then Yael, if you listen to her presentation later recorded, who is presenting right now, um, is talking also about the US border and detention because in some countries such as the US, asylum seekers and irregular migrants are placed in detention. And those are often overcrowded, pretty appalling conditions. So how can you socially distance in, in those types of conditions? Um, you know, that's certainly not possible. So my latest research trip, um, which was right before the pandemic, which is the Greek islands, which I had worked on many times before. Um, and at the time that I went, there were 40,000 asylum seekers on these little islands. Um, and the population density there at the time was more than any other refugee camp in the world. And it was in Greece. So that certainly, you know, the, the, the guidance we were given in the beginning of the pandemic was not possible for people in those situations. The next thing we were concerned about was access to basic services like healthcare. So it's often difficult and sometimes impossible for refugees and asylum seekers to access healthcare systems of the country that they're living in. So they're often excluded from any formal social safety nets. So that includes government provided universal healthcare, which is the case in many countries or financial assistance that governments are giving to their citizens based on you know, the, the challenges of the pandemic. Also, they're most likely to work in the informal economy so even if they did have work before the pandemic, they may have lost their livelihoods because it was informal work. They don't get any help from the governments of the countries where they live and they don't have work anymore. 
So um, the fourth thing that we were concerned about was the information that refugees and asylum seekers were getting. Were they getting correct, accurate, timely information? Were they included in that information sharing? So for example, when COVID began, the almost 1 million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh were prevented and prohibited from using the internet or cell service. And that was pre-pandemic for control reasons and other, and other reasons, but the Bangladeshi government completely cut it off before the pandemic. And it wasn't until August this year that they began easing restrictions. So how are they supposed to get information that's accurate and timely? Um, also, there's a lot of disinformation out there. Uh, refugees and asylum seekers are told all sorts of things and share all sorts of information that, that is, is sometimes inaccurate. Um, and also many refugees and asylum seekers don't speak the language of their host country. So, you know, information sharing needs to be um, inclusive, but that often is, is difficult and, and um, is not prioritized, especially as this pandemic is moving so quickly. Um, the fifth thing, I don't have too many of these, don't worry. The fifth uh, thing that we were concerned about was that we were already beginning to see the effects of border closures in the spring. Obviously that's when most borders were closed more tightly, but as the pandemic has changed throughout the year, the situation has improved, but humanitarian services and the supply chain of humanitarian goods like food were being disrupted due to border closures and shutdowns. So it wasn't just about, you know, these are kind of, we, we called them one time in, in a meeting secondary effects and then we had to change that to say associated effects. I mean they're not sometimes these effects are greater have a greater impact than the, than the virus itself. Um, so these shutdowns were difficult to get humanitarian supplies and, and services into these communities um, that needed, needed these services before the pandemic um, and certainly during. So even humanitarian staff were unable to travel to the countries where they were assigned to work or staff from within the countries that worked on humanitarian assistance were not able to visit the communities that needed the assistance due to travel restrictions internally or you know, meeting with people in person and that's still an issue. So that kind of disruption of access to aid um, is huge for refugees and asylum seekers and, and all people in humanitarian crises of which there are many. Um, and finally, the sixth thing we were really concerned about as this pandemic um, started was that governments, NGOs, and international organizations would redirect their attention and resources to combat the pandemic, but that the financing needed to respond to the ongoing humanitarian and displacement crises would fall dramatically. Um, you know, there's limited resources, so where do those go? So already, even before the pandemic, responses to many of the crises that refugees and asylum seekers are in are acutely underfunded. So the lasting economic impact of the pandemic on the global economy will only aggravate this problem um, and aid agencies are finding themselves overwhelmed with basically not enough money. Um, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with OCHA, which is the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Um, so they put out a COVID specific appeal for 2020 and they determined that they needed an extra 6.32 billion to meet even the most, most basic needs of people um, including refugees and asylum seekers, some, but so far only 3.6 billion has been donated. So about 50%, but we're in the end of November, almost to December. So, you know, there's there's limited uh, resources, resources, resources and resources and rather than ongoing humanitarian needs is a real challenge for refugees. So these were some of the issues we were concerned about relating to refugees and asylum seekers globally and the effect of COVID-19. Um, now, and this is, this is kind of based on our research and our work um, early on in the pandemic, March, April, May. But now all of our concerns have developed into serious problems as the year has gone on, um, with the exception of one, and that is the disease spreading rapidly through refugee communities. That, you know, with the overcrowding, the conditions of refugee communities, we were very concerned about that, as were many people. But we have yet to see that happen to a large extent, or at least to the extent that we anticipated it might. So this is very good news. Um, there's also issues with testing and you know, there are cases in refugee communities. Um, we don't see the high numbers that we expected, but you know, that, that's for a variety of reasons, but still it's good news you know, if, we can, if we can assume that, that it hasn't spread as we thought. However, despite less refugees and asylum seekers contracting COVID-19 than we thought, the measures that governments and communities have taken to combat the pandemic have had really disastrous effects on refugees and asylum seekers around the world. So 
Um, as I focus on women and girls in my work, I want to talk a little bit more in detail about how this pandemic has affected displaced women and girls disproportionately, as many things do, um, but, it, but it certainly has affected them in, in different and disproportionate ways than, other, um, than even the broader refugee communities. So first and foremost, the education and livelihoods of refugee girls and women have been dramatically affected by the pandemic. I mean, they have been for everyone, um, but refugee girls are 50% less likely to attend school than their male counterparts anyway, always. And of the girls that do attend, they're much less likely to return if they leave. So just as here in the United States and most refugee hosting areas, um, schools have been closed. And if they reopen, um, in these areas and communities, refugee girls are much less likely to go back. And as for refugee women, many of them are wage earning parts of their, you know, uh, members of their family. And it's crucial for their survival and that of their families. Um, some, actually high numbers of refugees are single headed households, female headed households. Um, so for refugee women, if they have a source of income at all, it is usually from the informal economy. Um, and by informal economy, you probably know what that means, but it means they're cleaners, they prepare food, work at hair salons, sell goods on the street, um, et cetera. You know, those, that kind of work that's it's a bit more ad hoc and not formalized. Um, so to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, governments around the world have ordered both formal and informal workplaces to close for at least several months. And again, this all changes depending on the country, depending on the progression of What's happening? I mean, you know, we're into different waves in different countries, um, but those those kinds of that kind of work has been disrupted and sometimes just completely um, eviscerated. So as a result, livelihood opportunities that were once scarce and difficult for refugee women to access are even less attainable. Um, so even after the health crisis abates and the government begins to lift lockdowns, and they are. Um, there's going to be immense and unpredictable economic damage from the pandemic um, and that will have lasting repercussions for refugees individually but also more broadly for refugees ability to access work you know as as we have economic <laughs> devastation in a lot of countries you know again the problem for refugees and asylum seekers is that oftentimes they are last in line for anything for assistance for you know livelihood assistance or, or help um, economically. So this economic uncertainty and the related lack of educational opportunities also leads refugee families to be more likely to engage in negative coping mechanisms or to be exploited. Um, so for women and girls, they're especially at risk because these risks include transactional sex, forced and early marriage, sexual abuse, human trafficking. Um, and these are also always greater for women and girls who are forcibly displaced. So were some of you in um, the previous session um, with Dr. I, yeah, one, the, the doctor talking about gender-based violence? Yeah, so for those of you who are in that session, you know, you've heard some of the details about this, but, but certainly that's something I focused on a lot because again, gender-based violence is a huge risk to refugees and asylum seekers, especially women and girls anyway and now it's just been exacerbated by, by the pandemic and the measures taken to deal with the pandemic. Um, so for example, in several Latin American countries hosting Venezuelan refugees and migrants, Refugees International found that displaced women and girls who lacked economic or educational opportunities were at a higher risk of sexual exploitation. And this is true of other displaced populations as well. Um, Moving on, another important effect the pandemic has had on refugee women and girls is that they have limited access to female specific healthcare. So this is a Physicians for Human Rights you know, conference. Um, again, I'm not talking about medical, you know, uh, I'm not providing medical information or, or data um, too much because I, that's not my expertise. But what is, is seeing how refugee women and girls can't access sexual and reproductive health services or maternal health care and how that's difficult anyway. And then again, the pandemic has exacerbated that. So, you know, governments and donors and aid providers, again, are redirecting a lot of their attention and resources towards COVID-19 prevention and response. So it's leaving women and girls unable to obtain other vital medical care to which they consistently need access. That's the other thing. It's not like one time, you know, response kind of stuff. You know, women and girls consistently need sexual and reproductive health services. Um, so we've seen that since the pandemic, those, some of those services are being interrupted or even eliminated altogether. Um, 
you know, without adequate family planning services, unplanned pregnancies will increase. And in turn, you'll need, you know, more, and it, it increases the importance of adequate female specific health care and maternal health care and all of this. And we've already seen this. We've already seen unplanned pregnancies dramatically rise and, and you know, um, some of these issues. So the final thing is you've probably read about this in the media because they've done a decent job of covering it, but gender-based violence or GBV, I'll keep calling it GBV, against women and girls has dramatically increased this year during the pandemic. Um, this is true of all countries and all populations. So from the US to the UK to Brazil, to China, to Turkey, to Kenya, to France, I mean, you know, within a month of the pandemic, we were seeing spikes of gender-based violence and gender-based violence increasing, especially intimate partner or domestic violence. So refugees and asylum seekers are not immune from this either. So as a part of the, the response to the pandemic, government officials have subjected more than a third of the world's population to movement restrictions. And within countries, um, you know, there's, there's mass quarantines and border closures and mandatory stay-at-home orders. So these measures, while helping to slow the spread of the disease, are also causing this alarming spike in, in levels of intimate partner violence. So even back in April 2020, the UN Secretary General said that there had been a horrifying global surge in domestic violence, a global surge. And he attributed this directly to lockdowns due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So GBV, including domestic violence, is a life-threatening health and human rights issue that is exacerbated in emergencies, um, including in the context of displacement. So I have a lot of examples of, of that. Um, you know, NGOs operating in Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh are already seeing higher rates than usual. Um, I mean, these as tensions in households increase and already sparse community structures are further weakened by movement restrictions and social distancing, rates of IPV will, you know, intimate partner violence will inevitably increase. And, Cox's Bazaar, where the Rohingya um, live, or in other displaced communities. Um, so I want to get into discussions or questions. Um, let me just share a few more points, and then let's take um, yeah, ten or fifteen minutes to talk, if if that's possible <laughs> with all of us. Um, so the other issue is that as GBV is rising so our services are decreasing often. So right, services for survivors are often not readily available. And even before the pandemic, there was very little funding directly to GBV um, services. And uh, now, you know, as GBV increases, there's even, there's, you know, the funding is, is limited and also people's uh, service providers ability to access survivors and people in need of assistance is, is very much limited. Um, I want to just mention two more things. Um, in addition to domestic violence, the pandemic has also increased risks to refugee and asylum seeking women um, and girls to human trafficking. So I don't know if you've talked about this yet today, but you know, women and girls, even amongst people fleeing uh, persecution, usually have fewer financial means and fewer options to find safety, leaving them highly vulnerable to trafficking. Um, and now with border closures and movement restrictions, those vulnerabilities are being exacerbated. The, the legal um, ways to get into countries and you know, seek asylum and access uh, safety are reducing and becoming smaller, which then leads to more dangerous routes, journeys, exploitation. Um, and you know, there's also been a suspension in law enforcement and legal services in some places. So it drives an already invisible crime because you know trafficking we don't really have good numbers on it um, because it is so invisible but it's driving that even further underground because so many services are disrupted um, you know yeah the UN IOM even the US State Department has talked about how they have significant concern that traffickers are taking advantage of the situation of the pandemic um, by finding creative and innovative ways to capitalize on the chaos that we're all kind of in as things change. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that. I have some more to share, but the last thing I wanted to mention was just forced and early marriage. That has also been something that we've seen um, increase. The risks to forced and early marriage amongst refugee communities has increased. Um, 
And, you know, it's, it's because of compounding humanitarian needs, schools closing, the shuttering of economies, um, you know, the pandemic has exacerbated all these factors that are risk factors for forced and early marriage. Um, so, you know, sometimes it is a financial recourse that a family needs to inject much needed cash into a struggling household, which, you know, people are faced with those decisions now. Um, but again, as this conference is on behalf of Physicians for Human Rights, there are so many health complications that come with especially early marriage um, that, you know, again, there's less services to provide for those, those girls. Um, so the idea in sharing these examples is to clearly demonstrate that while the pandemic is indeed a health crisis, the necessary measures to contain it have also created additional crises, um, especially for some of the most marginalized people in the world, which refugees and asylum seekers fall squarely in that category, um, and even more so female refugees. So um, I'm going to leave it at that. It's a little depressing, but um, you know, I think finally, in terms of human rights for all refugees and asylum seekers, you know, one of the things we need to protect as this as this conference is called defending human rights in the age of the pandemic. Um, I wanted to just leave you with one of the most important rights we need to defend is that we need to defend the right to seek asylum and even become a refugee. While it's not great, you know, a great situation to be in, you know, it's important. Um, and we've seen these rights shrink. So in a recent uh, Refugees International report, we wrote, quote, nativist leaders have weaponized public health concerns to justify unnecessarily harsh measures in service of anti-immigrant and anti-refugee agendas. So I'll just leave you with the fact that we, you know, you, you heard all the problems, there are solutions to help, you know, improve all those problems that I just mentioned um, on, on how COVID-19 has affected refugees and, and asylum seekers, but, but um, you know, we, we need to do a lot and we need to make sure that we fight against that weaponization that is happening and will continue um, as the pandemic continues to, to, to be in our lives and to be an issue. So um, yeah, I'll just leave it with that. We need to fight against the weaponization of public health concerns. So um, let me, I don't know how you guys have been doing questions before. Let me make this figure so I can see you all. Does anyone have any questions they wanna unmute themselves for or type in the chat or something you wanna discuss a little bit more? You've got about 10 minutes. Maybe not. <laughs> I can always talk more about this. Um, I had a question. Oh, I had a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know. Um, I know about um, the refugee situation and asylum seekers um, internationally, but mm -hmm. have you all been um, doing any research or work with the refugee and asylum seekers on our southern border um, and how they've been impacted by COVID? Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually. <laughs> The panel that's going on right now that my colleague is doing simultaneously is really talking about that, but it's going to be recorded. So please feel free to, you know, um, uh, watch that later and also even, you know, look at uh, her, her work. So her name is Yael Shacker and she focuses on the border. And yeah, there's a lot of ways that COVID-19 is impacting asylum seekers. I mean, the biggest way is that, to be honest, the U.S. government, and she knows the details better than I do. So, you know, she can correct me if I'm wrong, but unless they've changed it, they basically, I mean, they've completely stopped asylum. Even before the pandemic, they made it basically impossible to seek asylum through legal ports of entry or through irregular means, which is also legal to do, by the way. Like legally speaking, according to international law, you can cross a border in any way you see fit and be able to seek asylum and then, you know, have your case adjudicated um, with or without papers, whatever. But, but that is not what the US has been doing for years. Um, and then again, that's, you know, even that last quote I read was also a reference to the US, like, because the US is using COVID-19 to make seeking asylum at the border impossible, which they wanted to do anyway, and they were already doing, but like, they've added this COVID-19 as a reason and justification, which it's not. And the CDC, I think it was, even said that, you know, allowing asylum seekers to seek asylum cross the border, seek asylum and do so in like a managed way does not increase the risk of COVID-19 at all. And actually they're deporting people 
with COVID, without testing them for COVID-19 back to communities. So anyway, um, yeah, I mean, it's affecting, it's affecting our asylum system dramatically because basically, again, like the quote I said, I think it's giving an excuse. It's giving our government an excuse, an unjustifiable excuse to do what they want to do anyway, which is basically shut off asylum. So, so hopefully though, those things will change as COVID changes and politics change and all of that. But, but, um, but yeah, in terms of policies, that's how it's affecting them. And then I will say in the US, I didn't get to this at all because you know this is such a big title <laughs> topic, um, but there are a lot of refugees in the US. I mean, they, most of them have become US citizens now, but you know, resettled refugees over the last 30 years, there, there are a lot, there's you know, at least 3 million. And those refugees who again, technically speaking, you know, are oftentimes US citizens at this point. Um, they, a lot of them are on the front lines of our own response to COVID-19. A lot of them are the healthcare workers and the, um, you know, nursing home, people working in nursing homes and people working in essential industries and meat packing plants. I mean, all these kinds of things that refugees are working in. So I think one of the things we're trying to do at Refugees International is highlight some of those stories to be, you know, cause we have another department that really focuses on making, um, it's called strategic outreach, but trying to, uh, you know, change the narrative in the US about refugees and asylum seekers. And in doing so, one of their strategies is to like, yeah, highlight that this kind of xenophobia is misplaced and it's particularly harmful given the fact that many of these people that were refugees that we resettled are doing, you know, all this essential work. There was one state, at least I know as well, which which um, reduce their requirements for medical care people, basically. And by that, I mean, you know, there were refugees that came with medical licensing from their own countries that had not gotten licensed in the US, but they relaxed restrictions to allow them to at least administer tests or, you know, do things and really help with the response. So, yeah, that's, that's what I would say about the US, but certainly it's, uh, you know, asylum seekers in detention, you know, they're not given proper masks, safety measures. I mean, there's a lot of issues going on there where they don't even have the choice. Um, so, so that's certainly an issue. I have a question I received in a private message from a student. Uh, I'll read it right now. Or was yeah, please. Speaking? Yeah, please. I, I yeah. Uh, the Trump administration cut the U.S. contribution to the UNRWA. Most Americans mm -hmm. don't seem concerned with that move and seem indifferent. How can we change that? Um, first, educate people what that is, right? The UN refugee and you know the, the organization that provides assistance to Palestinian refugees, which again, in always has been underfunded um, and now, but the, the US is a major donor, you know, even still in the Trump administration, the US is a major donor to many of these humanitarian responses. Um, but yeah, they cut off all funding um, in a political move and I think first educating people about what it is, um, you know, what that agency provides and the necessary, you know, the necessary services and assistance it provides. And, you know, it's quite devastating. I, I think that even, even this year, I mean, they've, they've basically run out of money and a lot of it is due to, um, uh, uh, is due to administration decisions. So, I mean, education teachers teaching Palestinian refugee kids during the pandemic, I mean, all these kinds of essential services are are not being funded. Um, and I think, you know, I that's a good question. What can we do? Um, but certainly, as students, as most of you are, like, educate yourselves about it. And then also, you you all are more uh, powerful, I think, in numbers than than kind of middle aged people like me. But um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, just just kind of also doing the research to be very clear about what the effects of this lack of funding is because they're major and they're, you know, they could have destabilization, you know, effects as well in some of these regions that we do not want destabilized. We want services to, to get to them. So I think that's important. And yeah, it's important to know that UNHCR, you know, while it deals with refugees globally, Palestinians are one group of people that have, again, their separate agency, which unfortunately is underfunded and now even more so. Um, I had my own question that came up when I, when I was listening. So earlier yeah. on, you mentioned how 
according to international law, it's essentially legal for a, for an asylum seeker to cross the border in any fashion and declare and declare you know or ask for asylum. And the United States has essentially stopped that. Um, isn't that essentially in violation of international law? And why are they not being held accountable for it? From what I understand, again, I study this and have looked at this for 15 years. I mean, yes, it's against international law. Um, uh, again, I'm not a lawyer or a doctor, but I definitely work on refugee law for, again, my whole career. And that is against international law. However, like many other topics and issues, the US doesn't always follow international law. And also there's other countries that don't as well because international law doesn't really have any accountability attached to it. So, um, you know, Greece, Greece and the EU, they have, you know, they, it's a complicated situation the way they try to, they let people seek asylum that arrive, but they keep them on the island and they don't let them have freedom of movement. And, you know, there's a lot of different things that they do as well. Um, you know, Australia puts them in off on an island. Like, so a lot of countries, especially rich, powerful countries, basically, um, do what they want to do. Um, so I think that, you know, I don't really understand that. I don't really understand how that's not, um, you know, how the U.S. is not held to more account for that. But, but um, you know, that's kind of the work that we're trying to do at Refugees International too, is say, hey, like it's against international law. Like you can't do this. It's just hard to um, enforce. International law doesn't really have a good enforcement mechanism. So I would say that's why. Um, hi, my name is uh, Rebecca. Um, I was wondering to sort of end this on a potentially more positive note. Um, you know, one thing in Israel, which is kind of coming up with the pandemic is that we are trying to, you know, the organizations are taking advantage of the pandemic to try to expand um, healthcare services for asylum seekers and, you know, and, and trying to convince the government that these, you know, these, this is the best interest of Israeli citizens as well as asylum seekers. And I'm wondering if that's a trend that you're seeing elsewhere and if there's any, has been any success in really doing that and whether you think that would have any impact long-term. Definitely, I mean, I think this pandemic is, you know, a really clear and dramatic way to, to demonstrate that the health of your neighbor, you know, relates to your health as well. Like, you know, and I think that, so I think that that's really important. I think some countries are doing that. Um, Portugal might be one um, or Portugal, I forget what Portugal did exactly, but they they definitely like, again, loosened restrictions for asylum seekers that, you know, couldn't work and then they could work and work in healthcare and maybe get healthcare. They, they did something really positive. I don't remember. So you might want to look that up, but but there are some countries that have done some positive things and are, are doing that. Um, and the second part of your question is, do I think that would make a difference or what did you say again? I mean, I guess I'm wondering if you think that those kind of measures would have any impact long-term or whether you think yeah. this is gonna be like a five minute thing and then that's it. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it would, yes, I think it should. I mean, I think that there, again, we can, we, whoever we is, you know, myself, you guys, I mean, researchers, you know, government officials, whatever, can, can really demonstrate the benefits, you know, the cost benefit analysis and, and demonstrate that, that that is a good strategy long-term for other, I mean, other health conditions too. Like it costs the country more, even as a refugee or asylum seeker being there to have a refugee or asylum seeker have major health problems that they don't get addressed than, you know, had they gotten it addressed through a more um, inclusive healthcare system. So, I mean, I hope that for the US too, right? <laughs> so, um, but yes, I think that, that I think in some cases, it at least we'll have some examples of some countries that have done that and hopefully continue that more long-term and then we can use those as, as best practices. Hopefully that at least will happen, even if it's small countries. Um, hopefully we can learn from them. But that's a, that's a really good point. And I'm glad Israel's doing that and working on that. And they're not doing it well, but they're <laughs> doing something. Uh, at least attempting, at least attempting. Thanks everyone. Um, I think it's gonna close. So